Now, as I said, today we're going to begin this new series on the book of Romans. And we're going to try to find the bottom line in, the, in Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. This book came, contains some of the most foundational, inspirational, important, deepest Christian thoughts of anywhere else in the New Testament. It has a number of controversial doctrines, but it also has just some simple, plain, basic truths. It has advanced concepts, and it has a lot of practical applications. Six weeks, for those of you that know anything about the book of Romans, know that six weeks, we can't do it justice. So what we're going to do is try to get to the bottom line of six different thoughts or ideas. Uh, Romans, I believe, will inspire us with passion. The book of Romans will ignite us with a mission. And I hope it will ultimately call us all to action. Now today we're going to start toward the end of the book, in the 13th chapter, because this summarizes the entire letter. And the title of the message today is An Ongoing Debt. When you hear the word debt, what do you usually think about? Your finances. You owe money. But that's not the kind of debt Paul is speaking of. He speaks of another debt, a continuing debt. A debt uh, that because the price that was paid for us is so significant, is so steep, that we could never pay it back. And so it's an ongoing debt. We will never be able to pay it back. And all God asks of us in return is that we show our gratitude to Him by showing His love to the people around us. That's how we pay this ongoing debt. So the theme for this message is Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Now, is, as is the case with any good Bible study, any good serious study of Scripture requires serious obedience to the Scripture that you're studying. So we don't want to just study Romans. We want to become more like the picture of Christ that Romans paints for us. We want to become more like Jesus through what we learn through this series. And we find that the bottom line of this book, find that to be the bottom line of this book, and then study the rest of Scripture through that lens, that we are to become more and more like Christ. Now, Romans 13, we're beginning again toward the end, so let me bring us up to date on what is taking place. After Paul has written perhaps the most beautifully constructed presentation of the gospel that was ever written, after he has given us the case for unity in the church, after he has written uh, about salvation by grace through faith, after he has reminded us that God has planned our salvation from the beginning of time, and that he is executing his perfect plan to bring it all about. After all that, Paul comes to the bottom line. And the bottom line is Romans 13, 8 through 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, sometimes starting at the end, uh, with the end in mind, is a helpful thing to do. For example, uh, if, you're, if you're taking your family on a long vacation in the car, let's say you're going to drive to Disney World, as I have done a couple of times, I think, uh, it's not wise to get in the car and talk to the kids about how long the trip is going to be. 
It's not wise to get in and say, we're going to be cooped up in this car for the next 10 hours, so hush up and sit down. You know, that's not really helpful. What is helpful? To give them what lies at the end of the trip. You're going to get to meet Mickey. You're going to, you're going to have a great time when we get to Disney World. It's going to be wonderful. And the anticipation and the joy begin to build, and there's hope. So recognizing what's going to happen at the end can be a very helpful thing. Paul says, and the Bible points to us, uh, that if you start with the end in mind, it can help you live this life with the next life in your mind. And when you live that way, you can fulfill what God has called us to do. Paul says the only way to fulfill the law is to love others. And it confirms, confirming Paul's point was Jesus when he talked about the fulfillment of the law. And when we put our trust in Jesus and choose to obey his commands, salvation becomes attainable. Because through Christ, the impossible becomes possible. So through him, we can have our salvation. In verse 9, where he said, you, you got to love your neighbor, that word neighbor in the Greek literally means other. It doesn't mean just the person living next door to you, or the person living across the street from you, or the person living in the apartment next door. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean somebody that's just in close proximity. If that were true, uh, when you get upset with your neighbor, you could just move and then you wouldn't have to love them. <laughs> and there'd be for sale signs in front of everybody's house, right? Because we all have trouble with our neighbors sometimes, but we've got to love our neighbors. We've got to love others, not just those that live in our same zip code. Uh, Paul is doing what Jesus did, and that's trying to get the focus off ourselves and on to other people. That's where our focus needs to be, not on self. Uh, and that's what Paul is trying to tell us. You know, I did a series. I don't even remember exactly when I did that series, but it's been so, quite a uh, long time ago. Love where you are. Love where you are. And love then should not be just an idea, but love should be a lifestyle. That that's, that's, you love people where they are, you love people where you are. Love where you are. It should become second nature. And everywhere we go, and everything we do, we treat other people with love and kindness. The same kind of love that God has shown us that we have experienced then becomes overflowing. As Jesus said, we should overflow with the love that he has given us. And that should just come out as a natural thing, not something that is forced or something that has become a project, but something that is part of our lifestyle. Uh, when I was a uh, bus minister back at... Uh, even before, some of you know I was bus minister at uh, uh, Garnett in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but I was also a bus minister at a church called Cassaview in Mesquite, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. And uh, we, had, we had wonderful, wonderful times, great memories of what went on. And on our bus, Barbara and I had our own bus, and on our bus, we had a little boy who was often left home alone. And he, he told me one day, he said, uh, he said, you know, Mr. Ed, I'm, I get afraid when I'm by myself. And I tried to reassure him and, and tell him, you know, Jesus is always with you. You're never really alone. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, Mr. Ed, but I, sometimes I need someone with skin on. And it's so true. People need love. They need love to be able to be shown to them by people with skin on. Because we can tell unbelievers about Jesus and about God. And if they can't see him, which of course they can't, but they can see him through you because you have skin on. And they can, they can see what God has done for you. So how can we cover this debt that we find in the book of Romans? This ongoing debt to love people around us. 
Jesus said this in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang or hinge on these two commandments. Everything comes back to that, Jesus says. Everything comes back to love God and love people. That's what Jesus is telling us. And Paul uses this metaphor of debt to motivate us to love where we are. So with the time that I have left, I want to talk to you about three different reasons that we should love. And the first one is we should love because we owe it to God. We owe it to God. Here in Romans 13, Paul has already talked about the fact that the law was fulfilled in Christ. And we were made right by our faith in Jesus, not by our deeds, but by our faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 8, one more time. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Now he's not saying that unless we do certain things, God will not love us. That's not what Paul is saying. Uh, many people make the mistake of thinking they can earn their way into heaven by their good behavior. And, and I know that a lot of people are in and out, in their own minds anyway, are in and out of the grace of God. I had a good day today. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. I had a bad day today. Told a lie. Stole something. Whatever. If I died today, I'd probably gone to hell. If I die in the night, I'll go. I've known lots of people that feel that way. That they've just got to do certain things in certain ways in order to get to heaven. And, that's, and, and Paul tells us that's just not so. It is by grace, uh, through faith, that we attain our salvation. If it were even remotely possible uh, that that were true, that we could work our way into heaven, then the sacrifice of Jesus was a huge mistake on the part of God. Because it didn't need to happen. He didn't need to go to that cross. He didn't need to be nailed to it. He didn't need to, to have that spear jammed into his side. He didn't need that crown of thorns to be jammed down upon his head. If we could get to heaven on our own, we don't need Jesus. What are we doing here? But you see, we do need Jesus. He's the only way that we are able to get into heaven. We don't we don't owe God because God is angry. We don't owe God because he's unfair. We don't owe God because he overcharged us. We owe God because he paid everything for us. Uh, I mean, last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we were talking so much about the cross and Jesus going to the cross. And we remember that event over 2,000 years ago that Jesus hung on the cross suspended between heaven and earth with blood dripping down his body, gasping on that cross, trying to get a breath, trying to live. And every drop of blood that came down his body paid for my sin and paid for your sin. Every drop. And then the last thing he said, you remember? It is finished. Or some versions, it is accomplished. Three words in the English language. One word in the Greek. Tetelestai. It's a word that I've preached about before, but it's a word that is so powerful. Tetelestai. Because tetelestai wasn't just used by Jesus on the cross. There have been ancient documents discovered from merchants' records that have stamped on a bill uh, of goods, have stamped on an invoice at the bottom, tetelestai. There were men who had gone to prison and served their time and then released from prison. And they had to have papers with them to prove that they had done their time. And on those papers was stamped the word tetelestai. That word literally means 
paid in full. Paid in full. And that's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus did for me. And that's why we owe that debt. It has been paid in full. And Jesus said so on the cross. So Jesus hangs on the cross and he looks at you and he says, to Telestai, paid in full. He looks at you and says, it's done. It's finished. I've paid your debt. It's over. And we have a new beginning. So your sin debt has been paid in full. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And now our first response should be to show our allegiance to Jesus by living for him, by living his love, by reflecting his love to people around us. Uh, it says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. So the only way we can love other people is to realize that he loved us first. And when we realize the depth of God's love for, for you and for me, then our love for other people cannot remain shallow. We've got to have a depth of love like God has for us. So we love because we owe it to God. And now we love because we owe it to people. People matter to God. And so people ought to matter to us. When we realize how much we needed God's love, we know that we're not the only ones that needed God's love. I mean, we, I, I love this church. I love you. But when we come together, if it remains just us, I always have to ask myself the question, why are we not, why are we not sharing our love with those around us? Now, I'm not saying nobody is. Of course we are. But, you know, we need to share that love so magnificently that people cannot stay away from it. That people want what we have so badly. And reflect our, not just reflect the love to people, but the joy that that love brings us. I'm excited about where I'm going when I die. The older you get, the more excited you get. You know that? You're thinking about, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. And uh, get excited about that. You owe it to other people to share that good news with them. And you don't do that, folks, by being on the God squad. Being that person who goes into the office and points out everybody else's failings. Being the one that is always pointing out somebody else's sin, somebody else's lack of morality, and, uh, and being on what I call the God squad. Paul warns us, as a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 and 13, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that we in the church need to hold one another accountable. But we don't need to hold unbelievers accountable. That's God's job. That's what God will do. Now, if, if we see each other, each other falling into a lifestyle of sin, a pattern of sin or such, then we need to hold one another accountable. But those that are outside Christ, that's not our business. What is our business with them? We are to love them. We are to pray for opportunities to plant seed with them. We are to care for them. And it's not going to happen with a judgmental spirit. It's going to happen by loving them, by caring for them. Regardless, now get this one, especially in our society today, regardless of how different their beliefs may be, regardless of who or what they worship, regardless of what lifestyle they live, we need to love them anyway. Now, they may have differing views on gay marriage. They may have differing views on abortion, even politics. You do not, now hear me clearly, folks, you do not have to agree with them. You do not have to accept and approve their views but you do have to love them. No matter what 
they believe. We need to love other people and lovingly lead them to Christ. I read this week about a couple that took, took it a long ways. And what they do, and I'm th I haven't even told Barbara about this, but I'm thinking about implementing this myself. I'm not going to promise to do it, but, uh, it, be, but it, boy, it sounds good to me. This couple has an appreciation day for their postal worker. And on that day, they put up posters in their yard they put up a banner. Today is Joel Smith Day. They get, get his name and they put it up, make it an appreciation day for him. They do the same thing for their trash collector. And, and <clears throat> they make it his day and make a big deal out of it. Who does something like that? Christians ought to do things like that to let people know about Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to be distincting, distinctive in our acts of love. We need that way to tell them that God's love is available for them right now. And they will see that when, they, when we treat people that way. Ultimately, we should desperately want them to know who Jesus is and what he has done. I desperately want to know, want those people around me to know what Jesus has done for me and that he will do it for them. It's, it's not limited to just us. So we love because we owe it to God and we love because we owe it to people. And third, we love because we owe it to the world. Paul wants to inspire us with the bottom line and a practical application of the word. Romans 13, 11, and 12. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying, wake up. Time is running out. We're losing daylight. Wake up and begin to put these things into practice. Throughout the New Testament, we see the contrast between light and dark. And the light, of course, refers to Christians, and the darkness refers to the world. And it seems like it's getting darker, doesn't it? It seems like it's getting darker all the time. And so Paul says, we're, we're running out of time. You've got to wake up and get to work because the light will dispel the darkness. Folks, darkness will not ever dispel light. You're never going to walk into somebody's house and they say, oh, let me turn on the dark. <laughs> Can't do it. The light will dispel the darkness. And so we need to shine. We can get to the darkest of dark and you turn on a light and everything changes everything and that's the same thing with us when we live in this dark world and we shine the light of Jesus into that darkness everything changes because Jesus makes a difference Jesus changes everything and in light of what God has done for us wake up don't be lulled to sleep by this dark world Sometimes, frankly, we settle into our own little existence and we lose our sense of urgency. I read a quote this week. A man wrote, Your evangelism will sound like a sales pitch when your Jesus is just an idea and not a living person whom you actually know. So true. When you actually know Jesus, it becomes easier to introduce him to other people and not just give them a sales pitch. Guilty of that many times. I've, I've given so many sales pitches for Jesus, I can't count them. But as I got older, as I matured, I realized I've got to let them know what Jesus has done for me and introduce them to Him and not just to some planned pitch, but to Jesus Himself. Uh, so we better be ready because heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. I read a, a little story this week about a, a pastor 
in, uh, uh, in a little church, I believe in Ohio. Let me see. Yeah, near Cincinnati, Ohio. About or more than four years ago, he went into a restaurant. And uh, I want to read to you what happened as a result of sitting down in a restaurant and noticing that the waitress seemed to be having a tough day. His name is Jeff. And he said to her, hey, how's your day going? And she said, well, I'm really worried. And he said, well, what are you worried about? She said, I'm worried about my grandson. He's in prison. He doesn't have many visitors and he's having a tough time. And so Jeff said, well, I'll be praying for him and I'll be praying for you. Uh, and then he said, would you mind if I visited him sometime? And she said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't need to do that. It's a four hour drive from here to the prison. And, and that's just, that'd be way too much to be asking you to do and he said well that's okay I don't mind driving to see him so he got his name he made a connection with the prison authorities and got permission to go see this man uh, in that prison uh, so he drove up there he drove uh, that four hours and uh, uh, went in as a clergy member and he was the first clergy member to see this man in prison nobody no other pastor no other preacher had been in to see him and he talked to him and they struck up a friendship. And Jeff said, you know what? I'm going to commit to come seeing you once a month. So oh, it's such a long drive, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to come and see you once a month. And so he continued that. He's discipling him. And when he was released from prison, he became a member at the church where Jeff preaches. Uh, and uh, there are many people in that prison that have written letters to him since then. And he met a guy through the guy that got out of prison uh, who wanted to know if he would come and see him. So after, after he had met with the first guy, he went back up to see the second guy. And each prison has a different way of handling visitors. In this particular prison, what they had were tables set up for visitors to sit at, two blue chairs on one side of the table, one red chair on the other side. The red chair faced the guard. That way the guard could keep their eyes on the prisoner at all times. Uh, two blue chairs in case there were two visitors, right? So he goes in to visit uh, this young man. And when, he, when the young man comes out to the commons area to see him, he sits down in one of the blue chairs beside him. And Jeff turned to him real quick and said, you know, you might want to get on the other side of the table and sit in your chair or you're going to get in trouble. And uh, the guy said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And he moved to the other side and sat down in the red chair. And then he says to Jeff, I didn't know how this worked. I've never had a visitor. I didn't know how it worked. So he continued uh, to visit with him. He continued to lead him uh, to Christ. He prayed for him. Uh, and... Led, eventually led him to Christ as well. Jeff would tell you today that if he didn't love Jesus the way he does, he wouldn't have loved those two men in prison. It's so true. When you love Jesus that way, you can't help but love others the way you ought to. Uh, according to Paul, we all have a rather huge neighborhood. It's the person next door. It's the barista at the coffee shop. It's the waitress who's having a tough time today and maybe her grandson in prison. This is our neighborhood. At the cross, Jesus loved the world so dramatically and so completely that we can never, ever pay it back to him. But the beauty of grace is that Jesus does not ask you to pay it back, but to pay it forward and love other people. Show the love of Christ to all those around us. That's bottom line of Romans. Would you stand with me, please? And would you bow with me in prayer?
Oh, Father, help us to be more than believers. Help us to be doers. Help us, Father, to uh, show your love to everyone around us. Help us to be people who are in love with people because we are in love with you first. Thank you for first loving us that we even have the ability to do this. Please bless us as we continue through this study of the book of Romans and help us, Father, uh, to learn and to put into action the words that the Apostle Paul wrote to us so long ago. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, who makes it all possible. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day today.